New York Times hires a racist to fight racism, Jim Acosta being Jim Acosta, and WNBA players a little too tired to play, next on The Dr. Duke Show. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Duke, and thank you so much for joining us. As always, I am joined today by Katie Petrick of The Healthy Republic for the top stories. Katie, what's on our list this week? Well, it seems that when we get uh, a bunch of stories, they kind of come in groups and, and themes. So this week we're talking the First Amendment. And it all kicked off when the New York Times, a former newspaper, decided to hire a woman named Sarah Zhang. Uh, Sarah Zhang <coughs> is supposed to be the lead writer for their technology uh, department, I guess, but she's going to be on the editorial board. And it was discovered after the hiring that Sarah Zhang likes to go on Twitter and say some pretty racist things. Uh, one of her tweets is, are white people genetically predisposed to burn faster in the sun, thus logically being only fit to live underground like groveling goblins? Now, if you look at all the different tweets, and this goes back to about 2013, uh, you will see not just one or two tweets, but just a slew of tweets. And it's mostly against white people, but then she also made a lot of comments about men and about the police. And the New York Times is claiming in a statement that we had candid conversations with Sarah as part, part of our thorough uh, vetting process, which included a review of her social media history. Sarah Zhang has more than 103,000 tweets, and she's been on Facebook for 12 years, so I'm not quite sure how much thorough vetting they did with her. But they are basically acknowledging and accepting of what Sarah Zhang is putting up. Well, I think it's absolutely clear that the, the New York Times knew exactly what they were getting. They were not surprised by any of this. Uh, the New York Times does its due diligence. The fact that they were adamantly aware of the kind of tweets uh, that Sarah Zhang put out there is staggering to me. Uh, to me, this is a watershed moment in the culture. It's a watershed moment because what you have is the New York Times basically saying, we don't care that we're hiring a racist. It, they're too clever at the New York Times not to know this. Go back, throw that, Mike, throw that clip up again. The one about, this is a remarkable, are white people genetically predisposed? All right, so basically she is arguing that white people, remember how, you're too young to remember back in the 1980s when Jimmy the Greek got fired, a uh, sports talk caster, for making the argument that African American athletes were genetically bred to be superior athletes. He was immediately canned for that. Uh, for the last 25 years, such eugenicist arguments have been met with zero tolerance, unless you're... Sarah Young, throw that up there again, right? So human, white people are genetically predisposed to burn faster in the sun, and thus, logically, because of the genetic predestination, they, should, they are only fit to live underground groveling like goblins. Now that is some pretty hardcore eugenicist racism. That's the kind of thing that if you substituted any other race, any other class of people, you would immediately be drummed out of polite society and there's no way the New York Times would have hired you. And yet, they hired her anyway. And so why do I call this a watershed moment? The New York Times knows exactly what they've done. They have decided that racism against white people, men, white women to a certain degree is perfectly and utterly acceptable. It is desirable at a major newspaper. Uh, and so they brought her on board and they have defended the hire. Meanwhile, this is the same New York Times that has participated in every attack on conservative speakers being fired, being let go of their jobs. The New York Times was right there opining that Roseanne Barr had to go. Uh, all the people on the right who have lost their jobs over the years, for, for conservatives who have made uh, un indelicate statements, are gone. And so. This is a big deal. This ties in with our next story, though. Go ahead. Yeah, well, and, and I just want to make the point, too, that the New York Times has every right to hire this woman. Yes, they do. They can thrive or they can die based on this hire. And while they, they claim that they are for, you know, the First Amendment rights, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, uh, what's quite fascinating, and I'll go to this next story, is uh, what you have happening to people who don't agree with people like the New York Times. So you had Candace Owens, who's a conservative. She went on Twitter, and all she did was she pulled a couple of Sarah Zhang's tweets, and she replaced where Sarah Zhang had written white, and she replaced it with Jewish. So uh, Candace Owens put this tweet out, and this is actually the words of Sarah Zhang. Jewish people are bull, S word, like dogs pissing on fire hydrants, Hashtag canceled Jewish people. Are Jewish people genetically disposed to burn faster in the sun? And immediately, within I think it was about 12 hours, Twitter banned Candace Owens. And again, these were the, actually the words of Sarah Zhang. She just replaced the words. Um, now, there was outrage, which is to be expected, by a bunch of conservatives who just appealed to Twitter, and Twitter said, oh, it was a, a mistake that this had happened. And so they had... They put Candace Owens back on the platform, but she was told she has to take the tweets down. Now, to 
to today, I guess, at least nothing has happened with Sarah, Sarah Zhang's tweets. They're yeah, still there. Go back to that clip again. This is really, again, shocking. So what Candace Owens, Owens brilliantly did, and, and the added level of, of joy to this irony, is she's an African-American woman, right? Again, an African-American woman who on the left-wing suffering index falls way short of the, white, of the female Asian woman. You need to understand once and for all that the American left has, has enshrined now a double standard. We're going to see it in a moment with other people, too. We're going to see what happened with Alex Jones. The American left has enshrined a double standard where they can hire racists. They can hire people, who happen to be Asian and female, who use the same rhetoric against a race that the Nazis did. And then from their vaulted position as uh, pan -jam uh, of, of grand poobahs of liberalism, they allow that racist to get away with these kind of claims about other people. And so here's the thing, America. It's not that the New York Times doesn't have a right to hire a racist, they do. But that also means that the, the New York Times and liberal outlets all over that have been defending the hiring of Sarah Zhang have lost the moral high ground when it comes to trying to get conservative voices fired. The next time some conservative says something or some conservative baseball player who when he was 16 years old used a racial slur, right? No more, none of this reprogramming, none of this firing, none of this mandatory sensitivity training. You've shown us American left that racism is perfectly okay if you use it, so you'll pardon us if we don't pay that least damn bit of attention to your screams and your howls of anguish moving forward. All right, so that's just a couple of the First Amendment, and it continues because Alex Jones, who runs the, the website InfoWars and is well known to a lot of people for his outcries and a lot of conspiracy theories, he has been banned um, off of multiple platforms. So it started uh, with Apple on late Sunday. They removed all episodes of the show hosted by Alex Jones and four other InfoWars-related podcasts from the iTunes and podcast apps. And then uh, on Monday, Facebook said that four pages that belonged to Jones were removed for violating the social network's policy against hate speech. Later on Monday, YouTube remote, removed Jones and the InfoWars channels, and they said his account was terminated terminated for violations of community guidelines and he had been suspended on YouTube before um, for 90 days from the live broadcasting because apparently he violated the graphic content policy. Now what's interesting to me is uh, just recently Twitter, we were just talking about Twitter, the CEO Jack Dorsey actually said in a tweet that Alex Jones will not get kicked off of their uh, platform because and he finally put out a statement and said, we didn't suspend Alex Jones or InfoWars. Uh, we know that's hard for many, but the reason is simple. He hasn't violated our rules. We'll enforce if he does, and we'll continue to promote a healthy conversational environment by ensuring tweets aren't artificially amplified. Now, you have to remember, when you take a look at all these stories together, this is the same Twitter that lets uh, Sarah Zhang tweet her yeah, that's racist. The, how, how, can you argue, exactly. how can you argue that... Sarah Zhang didn't violate Twitter policies but by using Owens did. but Candace Owens did by simply repeating it. Right, exactly. Yeah. And now Alex Jones, uh, tw I, I don't know what is going on in Jack's head, uh, but Twitter is, it would be stupid for them to jump on this bandwagon because in a, in a way Twitter is, you know, a competitor to Facebook and all that. So it's really interesting to see which of these companies is coming out and defending free speech in which of them are coming out and saying what is like defining what their hate speech is. Well, what you've got here is clearly high level progressive collusion. And I, I default. See, we conservatives, we it's our own values that the valueless left use against us. Right. We on the conservative side believe and I believe that not only does the New York Times have the right to hire racists, knock yourself out. So too Twitter and Facebook and the rest, they theoretically have the right to control their platforms. However, there are all sorts of public institutions that fund these these organizations that participate with them, that advertise on them. Furthermore, you have a situation here where you have mainstream media outlets like CNN who are absolutely pushing and compelling organizations like YouTube and Facebook to start pulling off people like Alex Jones. So this is not just a private company here. This is not just some baker, a private baker in a small town refusing to bake a cake for a gay wedding. This is a major media organization succumbing to pressure of the Democrat Party. The Democrat Party, politicians, Democrat politicians, people like uh, Cuomo, the governor of New York, uh, compelling 
pushing against Facebook to ban CNN using its major media platform to co help compel companies like YouTube to pull down speech they don't like. This is where it's really dangerous. We keep hearing about collusion. We have no evidence that the Russians, Donald Trump colluded with Russians, but we have all the evidence we need that CNN and high-ranking Democrat politics, po politicians have colluded with YouTube and Facebook to ban speech they don't like. That's a chilling, chilling thing when you think about it. Yeah, and it's not just the, the media companies that when we look at them to, to think about, you know, what are their opinions and what their viewing is, what's happened now is because of all these different things and these stories that come out, we now have a survey uh, that is telling us that 48% of Americans actually believe that the government should require social media sites to monitor and remove objectionable content. Um, this was done by the Freedom Forum Institute, the FFI, and they release an annual State of the First Amendment survey. And now at the same time that 48% of Americans believe government should require this, 40% uh, of Americans can't even name one of this, of one, not even one of the five, if single rights that are guaranteed by the First Amendment. So you can clearly see why you would have out of the, it was more than a thousand adults who were surveyed, 48% of them either strongly agree or somewhat agree that the government should get involved. Yeah, before we get onto that story, uh, one last comment about what uh, Facebook and YouTube are doing, how this, this collusion to begin to begin the process of banning speech they don't like. The fact is, is that YouTube, Facebook, the Democrat Party, CNN, as far as they're concerned, the conversation, Katie, you and I are having right now is no better than what Alex Jones is doing. As far as they're concerned, Breitbart and the Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, these people are, as far as they're concerned, there's no difference between Ben Shapiro and Alex Jones. And this is the real tragedy here. Uh, the people who are deciding what is acceptable speech are left-wing politicians and news companies and uh, social, uh, uh, Silicon Valley uh, tech companies. They're the ones making these decisions. And so that's the danger of the slippery slope, right? If you can pull Alex Jones off, and, and we all agree that Alex Jones is a bit extreme, he can, he's a bit clownish, uh, that he's way out there. But again, to the left-wingers who are pr in politics and media who are promoting this, they don't see our conversation as any less stupid and incendiary as they see Alex Jones. And so that's what you've unleashed here, the beast. And, and what you said, Katie, the story you just brought up makes perfect sense. You've got an edu the liberals are in control of education. The progressive left is in control of education from kindergarten all the way through graduate programs and colleges. Are we surprised that half of Americans don't even understand what the First Amendment says, can't name a single protection of the First Amendment. Are we surprised that those people want censorship in the name of politics? Well, no, and, and, and there's an actually another survey that was done that you have to kind of take this all together and really begin to think about it. Um, it's actually a new poll from uh, Ipsos, and they found that actually 43% of self-identified Republicans, I think it's a kind of in a response to all of this that's happening, they want to give Trump power to shut down the media. So when you take a look at this, you have to determine for yourself, are you a First Amendment, uh, are, you, are you supportive of the First Amendment or not? Because once you define that line, then you have to, uh, it, it, what follows from your opinion matters then. If you are kind of wishy-washy on this and like, okay, you're, you're gonna agree with the liberal side or you're gonna agree with more of the conservative side, the conservative side would be to say uh, First Amendment rights. But if you, you have to draw the line somewhere in that, you actually have to follow your principle. And if you don't, you end up like these 43% of Republicans or these 48% yeah, of Americans. Yeah, but it's understandable, right? If 48% of Americans want primarily, exclusively conservative media censored, because that's what this is about. If almost half of American citizens primarily want conservative media censored, are we surprised that 43% of conservatives want the media censored? Well, I'm not say, saying it's right. Well, I'm not saying it's conservative either. It's Republicans, and that's, yeah, yeah you, degree, you can make the argument. The, you can make the argument. Non-liberals. Yeah. But the point is, is that um, the media has an obligation. The purpose of the, and to the 50% of Americans who don't understand that freedom of press mm -hmm. is it's one of the First Amendment protections. Yeah. And if 50% of Americans can't name freedom of press as one of the First Amendment protections, sure. I guarantee you that 80% of American college kids can't list it at all. So if that's the case, then media has an obligation. Under the Constitution, you are watchdogs, you are truth tellers. It is your job, American media, to inform the people how and what is happening. Over the last 25 years, you have taken on, a taken on a political advocacy role. You are now teaming up with Facebook and YouTube to censor conservative speech you don't like. You've got Governor Cuomo and Democrat political candidates who are arguing that 
YouTube and Facebook did not go far enough in censoring conservative speech. One p politician arguing that the the survival of the of the republic, the survival of the republic depends on private companies censoring and silencing more and more conservative voices. That's a very dangerous precedent, and it's been pointed out by many others that um, Louis Farrakhan, who has made virulently rabidly anti-Semitic statements over his career, just like Candace Owens. She substituted the word Jewish for white, and she was immediately banned. But the Jew-hating uh, Louis Farrakhan, his stuff is still up on YouTube, it's still up on Facebook. I don't see any Democrat call up politicians, not Cuomo in New York, none of them calling for the removal of those posts. None of the media moguls who run these companies saying that we need to be equitable in who we censor. That, my friends, is a recipe for fascism. Yeah, and just one more thing on this story. Uh, with the Freedom Forum Institute survey, unshockingly, those people who could name some of the rights that were guaranteed by the First Amendment were less likely to think that the government should get involved. Uh, we have a couple stories um, coming out of actually all across the world. So the first story is out of the UK. Uh, a woman actually just wrote basically a long, sad story about how she actually wishes she had aborted her Down syndrome son. So this woman is named Jillian Ralph. She's 69 years old, and she has a 47-year-old son named Stephen. Well, she wrote in the Daily Mail that uh, it has been, quote, so difficult has it been that I can honestly say I wish I had he hadn't been born. I know this will shock many. This is my son, son whom I've loved, nurtured and defended for nearly half a century. But if I could go back in time, I would abort him in an instant. I'm now 69 and Roy, that's her husband, is 70 and will celebrate our golden wedding anniversary next month. Perhaps you'd expect me to say that over time I grew to accept my son's disability. That now looking back on that day 47 years later, none of us could imagine life without him and that I'm grateful I was never given th the option to abort. However, you'd be wrong. Because while I do love my son and am fiercely protective of him, I know our lives would have been happier and far less complicated if he had never been born. I do wish I had an abortion. I wish it every day. So if you're considering marriage and parenthood and happiness and contentedness and easiness is what you want, then don't have kids. If you think the purpose of children, raising children, is to make your life happier and contented and more peaceful, then you don't understand the first thing about parenthood. So that's fine. And, and this woman, of course, like anybody else, has the right to say this. What troubles me about this story is in all the years you've been reading newspapers, and in all the years the Guardian newspaper has been publishing stories, have you ever read one story in that Guardian newspaper about a mother who had a Down syndrome baby and is absolutely thrilled that that baby's still alive? And this is the thing about the media. Whenever you can find one mother who regrets her, her decision, and I can't think of another one. I, you can go back decades and decades and decades and find almost no mainstream media stories about women who wish they had aborted their babies because they were Down syndrome. What, but when you find one, it's front page news. Meanwhile, how many moms of Down syndrome adults now have bonded with those adults are, are more than just fiercely protective. They see every day spent with their child as a blessing. We don't hear from them. Just like for every one nut that shoots up a church or a school, you have dozens and dozens and dozens of responsible gun owners who use their guns to protect lives. You never hear those stories. And so the complicit, goes back to what I said before, the media has an obligation to tell the truth, not to simply pick stories that frame their own political ideology. And if people want the media shut down, and you and I disagree, right, that it's one of the fundamental virtues of American government that the, we have a free press. But it also has to be said that if that press is no longer ideologically free, it's no longer free to tell the truth, but becomes an agent of manipulation in politics, which it's undeniably true that the American media has become, then we have a right to question not the right of free press, but the abusers of the right of free press, and that's the American media. Yeah, and while this story is coming out of the UK, we have another story that's coming out of the Netherlands um, involving the right to life, where we have an elderly woman who was forcibly euthanized. Now, this story happened about a year ago, um, but there's an update to it. So last year, a 74-year-old woman was reportedly suffering from dementia, and she was euthanized at a nursing home without consent or being informed at all of what was going to happen to her. She was, quote, 
quote, she was given coffee with a sedative in it, but she refused to drink it and then struggled as the doctor tried to kill her. She fought so fiercely that the doctor ordered her own family to physically hold her down and she was forcibly euthanized. Now, a panel had actually cleared the doctor of any wrongdoing, saying that she acted in good faith. But now the Regional Euthanasia Review Committee has said that her actions were unethical and the case has been passed on to review the review review board for further investigation so it's quite interesting to see what's happening in other countries involving yeah that's right and this this is really amazing too that and many people have predicted this this is not surprising same thing with abortion right the minute you legalize abortion and insist that it's a women's right abortions become bloodier they become more uh uh more uh frequent i suppose is the word we would use but they become bloodier they want to extend them to uh the full nine month term and now you even have some uh, abortion advocates wondering why you can't abort babies in the months and weeks and few years first few first few years after they're born same thing with euthanasia here uh it has been decided that this woman was too not in her right mind enough to determine her own fate and yet when she wouldn't take the sedative she knew what was going to happen to her and the doctor ordered the the family of this woman to hold her down so the doctor could murder her. It is murder. And the tragic thing about this is even though after initially clearing this doctor of any wrongdoing, they decided to take a second look at it, even if they find her guilty of violating ethics, she's not going to get fired. She's not going to lose her job. She will not spend a day in jail for murder. It's a consequence of accepting a culture of death. Yeah, in last year alone, 83 people who had mental illness were killed, by the way, in Netherlands. Um, Including little kids. Yep. Let's uh, let's talk about that Planned Parenthood since it always has something going on. Well, they just launched their new abortion manifesto, uh, and it's being called Unstoppable. That's the campaign they're going. Um, and it's ahead of the 2018 midterms. This campaign called Unstoppable has eight goals. Quote, the manifesto's central tenets are that our bodies are our own and no equality is possible without this. Birth control is ba- basic health care. Health care is a human right and abortions should be without restriction. Uh, The manifesto also calls for freedom from sexual violence, equal pay, paid family leave, and a rejection of racism, homophobia, and transphobia. And of course, all of this is because women are doomed. Thank you, Donald Trump. Yeah, you know what? Only idiots like Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, and communists put out manifestos. That's the first thing. Look at what you're doing. You're not putting out a statement. You're not putting out a constitution. You're not putting out a set of values. You're going to give us a manifesto, right? That's bad choosing, right? Um, so why don't you call it Mein Kampf manifesto, first of all? Second of all, how many of those issues on Planned Parenthood's list have nothing at all to do with women's reproductive health, right? And so again, we are turning over $500 million from Congress to the Treasury to Planned Parenthood public money. And already you can see how much of that money is going to advocate for left-wing political causes, number one. Number two, abortion is an absolute right. I can perfectly agree a woman's body, a woman's body is her own. I can perfectly, mm-hmm. I can perfectly agree that a, a birth control is something that everybody should have access to. You can buy it or not want to buy it. But where we draw the line in all of that is the way they slip abortion in there, right? Uh, absolute access to abortion without any restrictions. Murdering children at any point along the way. Uh, and to throw that in there, it really, I understand why they named it a manifesto. I understand now why uh, what you've done is much more in line with Mein Kampf than it is with any declaration of independence anybody ever wrote. Uh, What this is is simply a very narcissistic argument uh, that moms have the right to murder their babies at any point. That's all it is. Yeah. All right. Uh, Well, we need to address in Chicago Chicago. what happened over the weekend. Uh, It was a very deadly weekend, very violent weekend. Uh, Twelve people were fatally shot in and, and 12, 73 people overall had been shot. They had upped the number from 66. And uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who we all know from Barack Obama's days, uh, made a plea to the shooters and gangs to put down the guns. <laughs> he said, somebody knows who did it. These individuals out here in the street need to stop pulling the trigger. Where is the accountability for them? And Eddie Johnson, the city's police superintendent, uh, said that the police can be doing a better job, but he defended the police by saying, the police department isn't here to raise children. It's not about what the police department should do, it's about what you should do. And so far there have been 46 arrests uh, with gun charges, but you have to remember that Chicago 
has some of the strictest gun laws in all of the country. And overwhelmingly black shooters and black victims. Where is the NFL? Where is Colin Kaepernick? Black people killing other black people in, a primar in primarily black neighborhoods with a black superintendent of police killing black people. Where is the NFL? Where is Black Lives Matter? Where is Antifa protesting this? They're, it's the non-existent. Unless it is, remember uh, last week we talked about Anne Hathaway. One African-American woman was killed by one white male. And this was a cause for the entire white race to examine their reflexive racism. All of us, including Anne Hathaway herself, the degree to which her whiteness contributes to these murders. You have actual murders of black on black people in staggering numbers in the most, one of the most progressive liberal cities in the world with some of the strictest gun laws in the history of this country. And all you're getting is more gun death, right? So, in other words, the failure here is progressivism. The failure here is black culture. The failure here is big city progressivism. This is not about gun control. This is about the failure of morals and values and families. Even the black superintendent of, of police said, look, this is not about guns. It's about how you're raising your damn kids, right? Dad's not in homes. No education whatsoever. No worldview outside a progressive entitlement worldview. And then you wonder why this stuff happens. It is remarkable when you think about it, and the fact that the progressive left is utterly silent. Democrat politicians, utterly silent. Uh, NFL players, uh, LeBron, Big Mouth James, utterly silence about the slaughter, and many black kids. In these drive-by shootings, many little black children are being murdered. Not a word. No. Too busy. Black Lives Matter, too busy screaming at Candace Owens in a breakfast establishment that she is complicit with white supremacy because she's not a liberal. Yeah, and you gotta remember when Rahm Emanuel had actually called a press conference and was so proud of himself when he said, President Trump will not come here, we don't need him, and now basically you need him or you need someone, you need something to happen to change what is happening in Chicago. There was some of the, I think it was a city council uh, man, member who said, Donald Trump, if you can help us, help us. And, and, and I will say this about uh, the, the superintendent of, of the police. He's right. This is not a gun issue. It's not a conservative or a liberal issue. It's not a racial issue. This is an issue about progressive values and what it does to families and what it does to communities and what it does to people who would like to protect themselves from this random gun violence by, by possessing guns themselves. It shows you the failure of liberal progressivism at every stop along the way. I think you can tie in that statement, too, when he said the police department isn't here to raise children. You can almost tie it back to that woman with the Down syndrome son. Okay. We see way too often all these parents these days, they don't want to raise kids. They want to have kids mm -hmm. like puppies and put them on Facebook and put them on all these social plat uh, media platforms to show that they have kids, but they don't want to raise their children. Well, it's not even that they don't want to raise them. They don't want to be responsible Constable. for them, right? Okay. They don't want to have to be, if the kid's a problem or the kids require work or kids are expensive, Expensive. Boy, wouldn't it have been nice? How much nicer, the word she used, how much nice. nicer would my life have been if I did? And, and, and really, would it have been that much nicer if you had had a non Down syndrome baby? I mean, you still would have spent a lot of money on that kid. You still would have had inevitable ups and downs. Given the way we're raising kids today, the average 45 year old, is it really all that different? And so when you think about it, what you're talking about here is war on paternity, war on uh, parenthood altogether. And what we're seeing again and again across the Western world is people not wanting to have babies because babies are work. And so we ought to be able to abort babies. We ought to be able to uh, disavow ourselves from sick or, dis uh, or have the, the government come in and spend more time raising our kids for us. Just don't have those kids. And, and if you're going to come back at me and say, well, all the more reason we need abortion. No, you want all the sex, you want all the fun, you want all the comfort of marriage, but you don't want the responsibility. Uh, okay, one more story on this. Uh, we're gonna go to New York where a bill has been passed that would mandate for three months of paid bereavement leave and this includes even when grandparents die. So uh, the New York lawmakers approved a bill about bereavement leave to mourn the loss of a loved one. The bill would uh, include the death of a spouse, domestic partner, child, parent, in-law, grandparent, or grandchild. Now, the state's current paid fa uh, family leave law gives employees paid time off to bond with a new child or care for a sick relative. But this new legislation significantly expands the leave policies and allows for the grieving employees to collect 50 to 67 percent of the average weekly wage for up to 12 weeks. Uh, the bill is awaiting Governor Andrew Cuomo's, Cuomo's signature, and uh, there was an interesting quote included 
from Tom Gretsch. He's the president of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and he says that for a small business, I don't know how anybody could su- survive with anything like that. At the end of the d- day, New York City and New York State are among the most expensive places to do business in the country. This just puts another burden on small businesses. So I think it's an interesting thing to think about. And if New York goes this way, maybe the whole country then would go this way. So it's something to kind of look at. Should you get three months of paid bereavement for the loss of basically anyone. Well, I'm, what always staggers me about this kind of stuff is the is the progressive idea that work gets in the way. Mm-hmm. That I know many people, and I, I'm this way too, and, and almost everybody I know is this way. That when tragedy strikes, it's it's working, get getting out and doing things, right? Mm-hmm. Occupying yourself as a way of coping with it. It's this liberal idea that grief or sadness or sexual confusion or minority status, all these things preclude work. Work is the answer. The work of our lives is the answer to these problems. It is not the problem itself. It shows you really. Progressives aren't pro-worker, they're anti-work. They are not on, by raising uh, entry-level jobs at McDonald's to $15 an hour jobs, whereby McDonald's comes in and fires all the teenagers, and puts machines in to do the jobs, right? You, you don't care about workers. What well, You're anti-work. That's what American, modern American socialism is. And no one's talking about this. It's not pro-worker, it's anti-work. Uh, and, and work is at the center. Work on your relationships. Work as a parent to bond with your children. Work is at the center of every meaningful thing. And you progressives, you just want a workless world. You, you Endless vacations in the summertime. Parents who don't have to be responsible for their own kids. Uh, the idea that abortion can clean up your own stupid sexual mischoices, misdeeds. This idea is perverse. You're anti-work, and to be anti-work in love, in family, in government, in politics, to be anti-work is to be the party of the bum, which is why the party of the hobo, which is why now you've got people crapping all over the streets of San Francisco, and you're funding it. You got drug addicts hanging out in our major cities, and you're giving them the needles they leave in the gutter as trash. You are the party of the bum. Congratulations. Led by Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, who's never had a real job in his life. There it is. Okay, so we're going to go on to dunce of the day. As usual, we have five contestants to be our dunce of the day, and we're going to kick it off with Jim Acosta of CNN. Uh, At the Trump rally in Tampa, Florida on Tuesday, he was whining on air about how everything is unfair. Uh, He's saying it's not right, it's not fair, it's un-American. He's making a lot of comments about um, Trump's comment in a tweet that the press is being the enemy of the people. And he then tweeted that, quote, I'm very worried that the hostility whipped up by Trump and some in conservative media will result in somebody getting hurt. We should not treat our fellow Americans this way. The press is not the enemy. And uh, he also last week demanded that uh, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders give her personal opinion, personal opinion on the press being called the enemy of the people. He says in a tweet afterward, I walked out of the end of that briefing because I am totally saddened by what just happened. Sarah Sanders was repeatedly given a chance to say that the press is not the enemy and she wouldn't do it. Shameful. Where were, was Acosta and CNN when those Republicans were shot out up at the baseball game? They were not calling for uh, a tolerance and understanding. They were trying to analyze what about Republicans made them get shot. Whenever there's gun violence anywhere in this country, apparently any other gun, gun violence except black on black violence. Black on black gun violence, people like CNN have nothing to say about it. But in terms of any other sort, form of shooting, it's always the NRA, right? T- inciting violence. When Maxine Waters calls for getting up in people's grill, when endless politicians say, you've got to take the fight right to these conservatives. Don't let them have a meal. When people are being like Charlie Kirk is having water thrown on him in a restaurant when you've got other people uh, being pelted with eggs and garbage because of their conservative stances. CNN has nothing to say about any of that. Costa, you have lost, Acosta, you have lost, like the New York Times, your right to claim the moral high ground. All right, Kathy Griffin uh, put a tweet out because she has nothing else to do with her life. Uh, basically, just cursing a lot. We'll read it. It says, oh, F off, police in Portland of all cities, siding with and protecting Nazis, proud boys, and prayer, some S word. Uh, White America is to face the harsh reality that cops are are largely racist. Yeah, I said it. The cops are fighting the actual Portlanders and calling them Antifa. So Antifa shows up at a preordained conservative rally, not even conservative rally, kind of a fringe rally. But by all accounts, the conservatives got their their permits. They were marching. Antifa shows up without permits to protest and interrupt and violently clash with the protesters. Antifa calls itself 
Antifa. And Kathy Griffith, Griffith blames Portland and the media for calling them Antifa and is mad at Portland for protecting the right of unpopular opinions to promote their own world, to, to, to march and to speak. And of course, cops are largely racist. What's your evidence for that, Kathy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth Warren. So, Focahontas is hitting the campaign trail pretty hard, and she was speaking to Dillard University in New Orleans, which is a historically black college. She delivered what she called, quote, the hard truth about our criminal justice system. It's racist, front to back. Uh, she identified some of the system's failures. She talked about the disproportionate arrests of African Americans for petty drug possession uh, and overloaded public defender system and all this other stuff. Front to back, the American system of justice is racist. Again, Sweeping generalizations, uh, overwrought rhetoric, uh, divisiveness, because divisive, right? One of the reasons we have to ban Alex Jones is because he's divisive. Focahontas gets up there, right? Dances with truth, gets up there, and, and makes these huge sweeping broad generalizations. No one calls her on this. No one, no one says, look, you are denigrating an entire aspect of the American social fabric, like, like calling cops largely racist. Not a word to be said by the media about this, yet they're worried about censoring us. Shocking. She paints with all the colors of truth. All the colors of the wind. The wi only wind coming out of her backside is what's right. coming out of her front side. Which ties right into Rosie O'Donnell, who uh, she says that Trump is paying people to attend his rallies. She was on CNN with the other Cuomo, Chris Cuomo, and she says, there, first of all, people are paid, Chris. You know that. He pays people to show up at those rallies. That is a fact. And she also discussed how uh, Trump should be impeached and that he is loathed by all Americans. And uh, they said that with the election coming up, uh, that the Russians would have to fix it or he'll be gone. And she was in front of the White House uh, with a bunch of Broadway actors who apparently don't actually act on Broadway because they should be there with their job. And they did this woke sing-along, uh, and they had these balloons that said, spelled out treason, and it was a, a great rally. I go back to what I said a few weeks ago. I'm so glad the American left has rediscovered the word treason. Right? I, for, for 40, 50 years, anybody who committed any crime against the country, anybody, any soldier who deserted, any uh, uh, federal government employee who, who stole government secrets and sent them all across the world, they were just misunderstood patriots. This, remember when Hillary Clinton said, dissent is the highest form of patriotism? Well, good. I'm glad the American left has discovered the word treason. Uh, if we start applying the word treason to the behavior of American officials, you're going to find a lot more Democrats in the electric chair than Republicans. So bring it on, Rosie. Okay, and our final candidate this week is actually from the WNBA. We, uh, this is quite an amazing story. Uh, for the first time in WNBA history, a team has forfeited a game. On Friday night, the Las Vegas Aces aces, I'll pronounce that accurately, were supposed to travel to Washington, D.C. to play the Washington Mystics. Because of travel delays and cancellations, they were kind of traveling, they'll say, for 26 hours. So they got to their hotel four hours before the game, and they just, just couldn't go on. The Aces players talked things over and spoke by phone with the union Friday. They called the league to say they did not want to play, citing health and safety. So they're going to now receive a loss for this forfeit because they didn't show up for the game. And the Las Vegas coach, Bill Lambier, said, quote, our entire organization has the utmost respect for the very difficult decision our players made, and we stand with them. We are disappointed with the league's decision of the forfeit, but our focus is now on winning as many games as we can in our drive for our first playoff appearance. So professional athletes, I wouldn't call it highly paid because nobody watches the sport. And those 16 fans that were out who would have gone to see that game. Five I bucks. Mean, five bucks. I they mean, actually had them, five, $5 it, seats. It is remarkable. We feel bad for you. The 16, maybe watch reruns of Jeopardy or something, get the same entertainment value for your buck. Learn but something. don't tell me anymore that there's no difference between women's sports and men's sports. Don't tell me anymore that women's sports and women athletics are on exactly the same level as men's. First of all, it would never happen. You, you would never have a group of male athletes who, got, who had a couple travel delays four hours before a game saying, we're too tired to go out and play, right? Never happened in a million years, never happened. And let, so let's, let's just stop with all these false equivalencies. You, ladies, you just wussed out. Right, you just wussed out. You just, you know, it wasn't, it didn't mean as much to you. It was one of those things that, you know, you could pass on if you wanted to. And the fact that your coach stood up and says, I stand with the ladies and I'm disappointed that the league made us forfeit that you didn't show up to the game. 
and you're upset that the league was forfeiting you, that's why women's sports will not be taken as seriously as men's sports at the highest levels, nor should they be. It's one more example of what we've been talking about for a long time here. You can call men and women the same, but they're not. You can pretend as a man that you're going through the same sympathetic birthing pains as your pregnant wife. Guess what, you're not. We're not gonna take men who pretend to be pregnant the same way we're gonna take women who are pregnant. And we're not gonna take female athletes at these levels the same as we're gonna take male athletes because of stuff like this, it's goofy. Well, since you're a man, you can't say any of that. But since I'm a female, I will defend. I am what ah, I yeah, say yeah. I am. But I it, shut it, her up for, for one second. One second, one whole yeah. second. But yeah, when I read this story, I just started laughing because if it's baseball season and I'm a huge baseball fan. This is exactly what happens, you know, on a monthly basis. A couple times a season, you're going to have a baseball team and go up into extra innings. The longest uh, game, by the way, in Major League Baseball history was with my Milwaukee Brewers. Unfortunately, they lost to the, the White Sox, but it was an eight hour game. And they had to call the game at like one in the morning and resume it the very next right. day for another two hours. And guess what they did? They went out and played that night game because they had another game scheduled. So these women who they were traveling for 26 hours they were sitting down it's not like they were walking well they got from the, they could have taken a, they could have taken a three-hour nap. they got in to the hotel four hours before the game yeah. take a three-hour nap yeah i mean the idea that somehow it's just it's just the entitlement the whininess right yeah. at somehow now these women are going to be portrayed as feminist icons for <laughs> for asserting the right of their own body right these are our bodies we wouldn't we didn't feel like playing basketball today so we stayed in bed and we ate hagen does give me a break you can pretend all, you, you have every right to do that again like i said the 15 fans affected may or may not turn on you i don't know but you had every right to do it but that comes with consequences right it's you that's not professional you are not pro athletes that period you're just not pro athletes all right so who is your dunce of the day based on all of these lovely contestants that we have again this week tell me yours first okay I couldn't pick one. It was such a good, it's, 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 tough. It's, it's a tough week. Yeah. So uh, I picked two. I picked uh, Jim Acosta and Jim Acosta because Jim Acosta loves himself some Jim Acosta. All right, so I picked Jim Acosta though because and I could have picked for a multitude of reasons from what he did this past week, but I'm picking it specifically on how he treated Sarah Sanders, who was doing her job. Her job is not to stand up at that podium and say, I, Sarah Sanders, believe such and such. She is giving the message of the president. She's doing what her boss is asking her to do. And for him to continue berating her for not giving her own personal opinion just shows that he was not doing his job. He has made everything that he does all about his own political agenda. It's not about delivering the news. It's not the news that you can trust. Um, and for him then to come back and, and whine that everyone is against him just shows exactly why he should not be on air. And I think that's, a, that's very well done. I think I'm gonna go with uh, the WNBA. And, and particularly, I'm gonna go with Bill Lambeer, the coach of this WNBA team. The fact that the girls were just a little too verklempt, maybe you know they, their cycles had all linked in unison. They do. They link. Yeah, maybe yeah. it was a maybe the, the uh, a, a, maybe it was a, a below the waist thing going on there. Maybe it was anemia. Who knows? Maybe they needed to eat some dark chocolate and recover. Ooh. Maybe it was PMS. Right. Whatever it is, fine, ladies. You made your choice. No one takes y'all that seriously anyway. But Bill Lambeer, for Bill Lambeer to come out and argue that he's disappointed that the WNBA forfeited that game, that the girls had to lose. This is a classic example of liberal progressivism. We should be able to not live up to our obligations, not live up to our contact contracts, not earn the money that we're being paid, disappoint fans who've made arrangements to come out and see us because we don't feel like it. And how dare you, how dare you hold us accountable for the fact that we didn't do what we were supposed to do. That kind of stuff is progressivism 101. Okay, so it's uh, now on you to decide if you liked our picks or if we chose inaccurately. I kind of think we both chose pretty well. But uh, let us know what you're thinking about what we talked about on today's show. Make sure you head over to YouTube, watch us again, or you can always uh, listen to us on SoundCloud and iTunes. And that does it for us today. Thank you so much for being here. We look forward to talking to you next week.